share the word of the Lord today. It says, have you been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 from verses 1 through 13. I'm reading from the NIV version. It says, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. And so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name do you, did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness known, shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word today. Give us understanding and revelation in your word. Give us hearts to receive what you're saying to us and courage to go and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we know this story, all right? The history of this story, Acts chapter 2, all right? In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, sorry. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came and they were all filled. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they were going to the temple. And this man who was lame from birth, who would, they would bring to the temple to beg. They, Peter and they, he encountered Peter and then they said, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have we give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And that was a known miracle they, that couldn't be hidden because it says, if you read further down in this very chapter, it says that the man was over 40 years old. He wasn't a child, so it was known. People knew him, all right? And so now they were speaking and people were believing. They were telling people about this miracle and they were believing in the name of Jesus. They were getting saved, as we would say. And the temple people, the Sadducees, and those in charge, the religious people, didn't like it. So they called Peter, they, you know, get Peter and, and John, and they held them, well, we were saying prison, but they held them for a, a night, right? In jail, put them in jail because it was evening, and you know, the Jews and their regulation of the Sabbath, they didn't do anything after six, so it was evening, so they kept them in jail until the next day, right? So now they were before these group of men, and it says, notice who was there? The big Sawatis and them, you know. K.I. first. John, Annas, Alexander, and others of the high priest family. Big people. These men were standing before. Peter and John were standing before. And they said, by whose name? Who gave you authority to do what you're doing? And here Peter answered them. And of course, based on Peter's answer, they were like, there's only one thing. These men have been with Jesus. We know when we encounter something, there's a residue that leaves. Think about encountering a bush bug. 
Yeah? If you touch a bush bug and you go somewhere, we know. We know a bush bug. Don't, don't talk about Mr. Skunk. If he spray you, you're in trouble. Yeah? You gotta get rid of clothes, everything. How about our favorite food? Portugal. You can't hide and eat a Portugal. <laughs> you can try, you know, back in the day, my mom said, put it in a bag and you put your all kind of stuff. You can't hide from the Portugal. How about alcohol? I know they tell you all kind of stuff to do to kill the scent and all kind of Nah. Don't work. There's always, in all these things I mentioned, there's an, a lingering a, a, aroma. There's a scent, a residue. Something that remains because we have been in touch. Not necessarily been with for a long time, but we've been in touch with these things, and yet they keep lingering with us. It says here that these men had been with Jesus for over a period of time. We know from the reading of the, the, the Gospels, we know that these men were and had been with Jesus. They were there when he turned water into wine. They were there when he cast out demons and devils. They were there when he raised Lazarus from the dead, when he raised Jairus' daughter. They were there when he healed the sick and many others, the blind man, and many others that we read about. They were there when he fed the 5,000. They were there when he told the children to come. Come, children, come to me. They were there when he ate with publicans and sinners. They were there when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. They were there when he was led away. So based on historical facts, the disciples have been with Jesus. So when the leaders noted, when they said, you know, these men had been with Jesus, it was not only a statement of fact. Because it was a fact. It was not only a statement of fact, but it was a statement that recognized the transformative power of being in Jesus' presence. We know that the disciples learned many things from Jesus. Some they learned by asking Jesus questions. Some Jesus taught them. And some they just learned by observing. All right? They observed what Jesus did and so on. So we know that they've been with Jesus. But today we look at one thing that they learned from him. They learned from Jesus. They learned boldness from Jesus. They learned boldness from Jesus. We we'll admit that Jesus was a bold well, fella, bold man, however you want to say. He was bold and sometimes brass face about it. Bold. Where did he get it from? Where did Jesus get this boldness from? Jesus, we know that Jesus, uh, uh, after, after um, the temptation, he came out and he says, the, repent, the kingdom of heaven is here, is near. Yes, John talked about repentance, but Jesus was saying, apart from that, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is near. That was a bold statement. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus also called those religious leaders a brood of vipers. <laughs> Think of you taking the IRO and saying, you wicked snake people. That's what Jesus called these religious people back in it. That, that was a bold statement. He said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you are of your father the devil. What? Bold statement again. And at the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus stood up and said, Lazarus, come out. What kind of craziness is this? Bold. Jesus was bold and he proclaimed. How about going to your hometown? In Luke chapter 4, we read, Jesus went to the synagogue in his hometown. Um, he went into the temple and he read from Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me and so on to preach the gospel. Take some time and read it. And then he closed the scroll and he said, that scripture is fulfilled today. 
right before you. In other words, I'm fulfilling the scripture. That was a bold statement to go to your hometown, people you grew up with, and say, look at me, is the, that scripture is, is me. That was bold. Where did he get it from? Jesus recognized who he was. He recognized who he was. From that very scripture we just read, that we, I just quoted, that he recognized that he was anointed and appointed. He was anointed and appointed. He knew he, who he was. He wasn't fishing. He knew he came from the Father. He knew that he was sent by the Father. He knew he was here to accomplish a, a specific purpose. He knew it. He knew also that he was in the Father, and he proclaimed it. He says, John chapter 30, he says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. That was, again, another bold statement for, for the, the children of Israel to hear. What, what are you talking about? Oh, your father? Oh, father. And they were talking about, you know, in context, their father, Abraham, and they're going off. He said, but I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Jesus knew, and he said, not only that, he said, I and the Father are one. I am the Father of So he knew who he was. And, and, in, and in knowing who he was, he was able to make bold statements. He was obedient. Jesus said, I, I do only what the Father tells me to do. Think about that. I, do, I only do what he tells me to do. I only do what I see him doing. That's what I do. I don't do anything else. He was obedient to the leading of his father. Well, his father. It says, Philippians chapter 2 tells us that he was obedient even unto death. Even unto death, Jesus obeyed the father. So we wondering how we get his boldness. He knew who he was. He was obedient. He operated under authority. Jesus did all that he did under the father's authority. Jesus was concerned about pleasing his father. I want to please him who sent me. I only do, John chapter 5 verse 30, I only do what, he, what pleases him, John 8, 29. And I only do all in my father's name, John 10, 25. He operated in authority. Jesus was not a maverick fella just going about it. It may seem so when we read, but he was not a maverick. He operated under authority. He had the affirmation of the Father. At, at his baptism, the heavens opened, dove descended on him, and the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. In whom I'm well pleased. I'm pleased in what he's doing. I'm pleased because he is following. He's being obedient. He is showing us, modeling for us what we should do. Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed. You might think, well, Jesus is God. What are he praying for? What was he praying for? But he was showing us how to be bold. He was showing us, among other things, but we are considering how to be bold today. He was showing us how to be bold. He prayed. Luke 9, 16 tells us Jesus prayed before meal. <laughs> some, of us, some of you just dig in. It says that when he was feeding the 5,000, he lifted up the Lord, blessed it. He prayed. He might say, that's a simple thing. What are you praying for that for? We know we're going to eat. Whatever it is, we know you're going to eat. When you leave here today, pray. Thank God, bless it. He prayed before miracles. Jesus could have, you know, just, we know he could have snapped his finger and do things, but Jesus prayed in, in, in Lazarus. He says, he lifted up his, he said, Father, I'm praying to you. I know you hear me. And it's not, I, I'm not praying for me, no. I know you, you hear. I know you understand. It's for the people around. Not for you. We, we, we communicate. But I'm doing this for those around. He prayed. Jesus prayed. Well, we know these are public prayers. Jesus also prayed privately. Luke chapter 4, 42 tells us that Jesus prayed early in the morning. 
and alone. He prayed early in a solitary place. So he was praying by himself with the Father. What are you doing that for? He was modeling for us how to be bold. How, to, how do we get this boldness from? Where do we get it from? Some of the things. He prayed early and alone in a solid, solitary place. The disciples said the disciples were looking for him. All right? And whenever they were looking for him and they find him, he was praying. He was praying. And you might say, oh, prayer is a waste of time. No, brothers and sisters. That's the source. That's the connection. That's the connection. We can't go on if we don't pray. Jesus was also full and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's another one of the keys. He was full of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. After he uh, um, came back from the temptation, it says that, this, no, before, this, Jesus being full of the Spirit was led into the wilderness to be tempted. Read it. Being full of the Spirit, he was led into um, the wilderness to be tempted. And after the temptation, it says that Jesus returned in the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 4.14. So he was not just full, but he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew who he was. He was obedient to the Father. He operated under authority. He had the affirmation of the Father. He prayed. And we know that he was full of the Spirit and empowered by the Spirit. So here we read in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, all right, and we know the account that he said, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. So we know, we knew, we know, sorry, in Acts chapter 2 that they were full of the Holy Spirit, right? And here they are, Peter standing before this Holy Spirit, empowered him to say what he had to say. Notice, what they said, when they saw, verse 13, the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. We know the story of Peter and John, they were fishermen that Jesus called to be their disciples. And they were transformed by being in the presence of Jesus. And now, the schooled, trained people were saying, but what happened to these men? We know them, they didn't go to rabbi school. Back in the day, that's what, you know, what their schooling was. They didn't go to to, to learn about the law. They didn't know um, everything about the Torah. They were unschooled and ordinary men. If you know anything about fishermen, they're ordinary, quote unquote. Consider them ordinary, but these are the very same men that Jesus transformed changed their lives from the inside out. And these are the very men that stood before the Sanhedrin, the big Sawatis, and proclaim the name of Jesus and say, what we are doing here is in the name of Jesus. They were speaking, using that name, under authority. They were operating under authority because they knew it's not about them under authority, they spoke and they said it's in the name of Jesus Christ, the very person that you all crucified. And we know the Sadducee has an issue with, they, they, they didn't like resurrection, telling people about resurrection. Don't tell no, so talking about Jesus was a big thing for them. All right? But Peter and John were able to proclaim this good news that Jesus Christ well, it was evident for the people to see that Jesus Christ had transformed them. 
you might feel that you're ordinary. I didn't finish high school. In fact, I didn't even finish primary school. Now I'm just saying what you might say, might be saying in your, in your head. I don't have all, sometimes, when I open my mouth, green verbs come out. I can't get the subject and verb right at all. I can't speak, and in all the things that we're probably saying in our mind, all the excuses, and we think about ourselves as insignificant. Well, I can't talk like Sister Marsha. I can't stand up in front here and do nothing. You see, being in front of people, I just start to, my heart just start to palpitate. Yeah? Feel I will faint. And we start to make all these excuses in our head, thinking, making ourselves ordinary. But, get into the presence of Jesus. Get with Jesus. And he will transform you. Yes. Brothers and sisters, you will be surprised at your very self. Yes. What Jesus can do with you. Yes. That you consider yourself ordinary. There is no way you can be with Jesus and it not show. Just like you can't be with a bush bug. You can't encounter a bush bug, a skunk, a, port a Portugal alcohol. And it, and it not show. There is no evidence of it. There's no way that could happen. There's no way our speech wouldn't change. Our lifestyle, our conversations, the things we talk about, our behaviors, how we behave, not just at home, but out wherever we are, how we behave. Everyday happenings would remain the same. There's no way. If we've been with Jesus, if we have been in his presence, if we've been engaging in prayer, if we've been daily in taking the word, if we are fellowshipping, there's no way we can be the same. No way. And just like you, there's evidence, there will be evidence. We will know when we've been with Jesus. We'll know it. It, it will, just like Zoo, there's nothing you can do about it. We will see it. We will feel it. We will hear it when you've been with Jesus. Jesus has the ability to transform. Change. Moving from left to right. If you're in the middle, move your right or left. Whatever, whatever he has to do. He has the ability to do it. But you and I, we need to be with Jesus. So you might say, how, we, how can I be with Jesus? Acts chapter 2, verse 42. So we know we, we read in, on the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit came, Acts chapter 2, verse then they continued. Let me, let me read it. I apologize, I should have had this before. Already queued up. All right. But when, so they devoted themselves, so after those Peter preached and the 3,000 were added, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, word, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer. All right? So they were engaging, how we getting close to Jesus, being with Jesus, prayer, the word, fellowship, Communion. Those are the things that we have before us. To get in with Jesus. You might say, you don't have to jump no hoop. We feel that we have to jump hoop and walls to be with Jesus. In fact, Jesus is in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. He's here with us. So we just need to say, you know, like we meet somebody. Jesus, this is my time to meet with you. Be with Jesus. In prayer. In fellowship. Like I said, there's no way we can't be in his presence and not be for transformed. Jesus has the ability to transform cowards, untrained, green verb users, 
out of time in people, lonely, good for nothing people, troublesome people that we consider troublesome, depressed, fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals, lesbians, bisexuals, transgender, in other words, sinners, and transform them if we'll get in his presence. If we'll just stay with him, be with Jesus like the disciples were, and so that they took note that they had been with Jesus. His presence is in us. Jesus is with us, as we heard from Ty as he sang that, so if you could get it, Emmanuel. We just need to be with him. Yield to him. Take time. Take time. Get in his word. Get in prayer. Fellowship. Communion. With the saints of God. And we know your lives will be transformed. Hallelujah. You will never be the same. And we know we know about the, the transformation by the, the word of the Lord. Renew now for mine. Yes, that will take place. As we and, and it's it's not it's not something we we um go in and say, yes, trans, transform me. As we read the word, we are being transformed. And we don't even know it. It's happening right before our very eyes. So my question to you is, have you been with Jesus? Amen.